here and I'm covering the Idaho Four. For those that are new to this channel and don't know what the Idaho Four are, it's for university uh, college students with the ages of 20 to 21 years old uh, that were living in off-campus housing on the outskirts of the University of Idaho in Moscow, Idaho. They were slain in their sleep on November 13th in the early morning hours between 4 a.m. and 4.25 a.m. in the morning. It is believed that Brian Koberger, a um, student at the nearby Wazoo, Washington State University, He was a PhD major in criminology, committed this crime. So there was a Reddit post that came out um, asking a question, you know, talking about if we had a look at one singular piece of evidence, you know, it's Reddit, not the court, as the uh, statement says. Well, here, let me just let you take a look at it for yourself, and then we'll be back to discuss it. So here is an interesting post on Reddit. Um, talking about DNA or sheath. And it's a question for users with a poll. I'm not going to put a poll on my channel related to this, but uh, I thought that the question itself was a very good question. The single source of DNA on the snap of the sheath that match BK proves that he was in the house at the time of the crime. That is the question. Um, there's an edit. It says, in court, juries are asked to consider all evidence. This is Reddit not a court, and the question asks you to consider a single piece of evidence and whether a specific conclusion can be drawn from it. So I thought that this was, again, a very interesting post. It really kind of makes you uh, think so you hear the question, you know, it's related to the single piece of evidence, you know, the, the sheath with his DNA on it. And it's asking us, can we make a determination from that singular piece of evidence? The only determination that I can garner from that single piece of evidence is that Brian or somebody he knew was very close to, um, uh, at the crime scene at the time the crime happened. So that's what I can garner from that singular piece of evidence. I don't think that the, the evidence by itself with the DNA or the sheath um, actually convinces me that Brian Koberger himself was there, but rather that somebody, him or somebody he knew that was close to him was there. However, if you watch my channel and you've been following me through this case, you will know how I feel about that sheath and that single piece of DNA evidence. I think that that is insignificant. It really is insignificant. Um, a lot of people say, how can you say that, Betty? Insignificant, it's DNA. Because it's not. that's not the slam dunk for this case. That is only one tiny little sprinkle on top. Everything else, it is the phone records, the, the, the forensic data in this case. I think the forensic data in the Brian Koberger case is so damaging to his case. I don't know how his attorney is going to overcome it. But if you're asking me specifically about the sheath and the DNA and what I can garner from just that specific uh, piece of evidence, uh, again, the only thing I can garner from that is that he or somebody very close to him left were, was at that crime scene. What we do know about Brian Ko Koberger is he didn't have a lot of friends. He didn't hang out with anybody. Outside of one running partner, we didn't really find anybody that was his friend. Um, so it kind of eliminates the possibility in my mind that that could have been left by anybody other than Brian Koberger. But with the DNA evidence, I think that it kind of solidifies the overall picture. But I think the most damaging and damning uh, to Brian Koberger's case is going to be his the, the forensic data that is uh, submitted into the court 
that will be, uh, that will seal Brian Koberger's fate. I'm not sure how my audience feels about it, but when we go over the Brett Payne affidavit, it does have a lot of information. Um, him, uh, Brian Koberger, visiting that residence over 12 times. Many of you guys know from the beginning uh, on my first trip, I, I was very specific in who I thought did this. Um, what I actually believe we're gonna find out is this person was not in their inner circle, but I really truly believe that this person at some point in their path was humiliated. I, I, I can't tell you who the person is. I can only describe what I believe we're going to find out once the assailant has been caught. I also believe that he has fantasized about this. I believe that he's gone to their house. Um, but I believe this is a loner. I think this is a, a person that's got um, a, a complex, but I don't think this was sexually motivated. I think this was humiliation and I think the act was for power I think he wanted to let them know who he was and how powerful he was um, this is the kind of person that I think that is going to be ultimately uh, charged with this crime but again I don't know what that person's name or what they look like is I just didn't know the person's name now that Brian Koberger is arrested and behind bars that profile was very very uh, similar to who Brian Koberger really is. But this case has been so complicated because, but seemingly not, and here's what I mean by complicated. There were so many potential suspects in this case that it made it hard to get a good, clear idea who could have committed this crime. Even I myself was starting to entertain that one of their close inner circle friends may have done this. I never really said that to my audience because I tried to look at the facts of this case. But what I can tell you is that when I got there for my very first time, the very first time I looked at that home, I said it was not them. And I also went as far and was bold enough to say that this man has been to this house more than one time. I also believe that he has fantasized about this. I believe that he's gone to their house. And I even went further than that and said multiple times. So when we find out the facts of the Brett Payne affidavit, where they use that um, forensic data, we find out that Brian Koberger visited that home 12 times, 12 times that they can prove. That is a lot. I also believe, and I said this to my audience, that I believe he actually planned on doing this a couple times before he actually committed the crime. I believe that he was out there, he was ready to go, and for whatever reason, he got scared or uh, just couldn't go go through with it. And I think that that is still true, even though that information has not come out. I'm speculating on this aspect of it, and it's the front door being open uh, the morning of the 13th. There was an eyewitness that said that they drove by the house at 1122 King Road in the early morning hours around 8.30 to 9 a.m. in the morning and the front door was wide open. I truly believe Brian Koberger went back into that home that morning. There is evidence that he and his phone were in front of that home after the murders around 9, 12 a.m. in the morning. And there was there, that, that uh, crime still had not yet been called in because as we know, that was not called in until around 11.58 in the morning. So if we were to go back to the original question as to if you were to, to have to look at uh, a singular piece of evidence and that singular piece of evidence being uh, the sheathing, the sheath and the DNA, what would your, what would that do for you? What, what would you garner from that key piece of evidence, that singular uh, piece 
of evidence. I'm interested in your comments. Uh, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and hit that notification button to all so you don't miss good topics of conversation, uh, videos related to new and differing perspectives. And if you are interested in doing more for the Bullhorn Betty channel, consider becoming a member. God bless each and every one of you. And until next time, be safe.